welcome to another episode of the Heart of the Matter. Today we're talking about Africa's biggest audio book. We have with us Naomi Lucas, who is the founder of Graduate Pro and the creator of the book, I'm a Graduate, Now What? Naomi, thank you very much for coming to the Heart of the Matter. My pleasure is all mine. Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Let me make it easy, because a lot of times when people see, tell me about yourself, I'm like, ah, jam question, there's so much to say. Um, I will summarize by saying that I'm a very passionate person. Um, I lost my parents when I was pretty young, um, and by the time I was done with school, my dad passed as well, so things were kind of hard, you know, growing up. Um, but I realized something very critical, that if you're going to make, if anything is going to happen in your life, then you have to intentionally make it so. So I think from that perspective, it was easy for me to make conscious decisions on a daily basis on the kind of person that I was going to be. I'm extremely passionate. Um, I don't want to use some words. I'm extremely passionate. Um, I love young people because I, I think that the future of this great country is dependent on the young. Forget about what we have now where youth ministers are 60 years old. Mm. We need to begin to pay attention to young people. Even the demographics? Yes. So many young population. Yes. Africa, Africa we have 70% of the population below 35. You know, so I'm extremely passionate. I love what I do um, and I believe in Nigeria. So what do you do? Well, I run a multi-service company called Ecla. Basically, a cloud does three things, transmedia, creative project management, and then talent. Graduate Pro is a brand under the company called Ecla, okay. and it falls under our talent division, where we try to make things happen, basically skill up the African workforce. Okay. That's what I do what on a day-to-day, -day. yes. Okay. So, um, on social media, mm. hashtag Africa's biggest mm. book project, what's the story behind this? Mm. Okay. I used to manage a multinational account okay. in, a, in a youth marketing firm I was working for. And um, they had a nationwide project that basically spanned about 32 states. And I was project manager for that project. Um, I needed about 80 to 120 people to work with. And I had very little time to roll out. Okay. So I sent a couple of people in advance to try and help recruit um, so I could come and then, you know, finalize the people I wanted to work with. So contrary to popular opinion that there are no jobs, I had quite a number of jobs I wanted to give out. And I hit the road and increasingly became very depressed because I had jobs, I couldn't find people to take them. And so looking- there are jobs. There are jobs. But the question is, are you the person we're looking for? So. I don't agree that there are no jobs. It's not a popular thing to say, but that's the truth. There are jobs. I have like five right now that I know of, and I can't help the people who want to recruit because I, I don't know anybody who has the skills they're looking for. So we have a skill problem more than we have an unemployment problem. So <clears throat> I became increasingly depressed um, just seeing the caliber of young people that we And the, the more I moved outside of Lagos, the worse it became. Young people who had degrees that couldn't speak English, who had no idea what they wanted to be and why they wanted the job. And I knew I was going to do something when I started seeing them in my dream. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I didn't get around to, to doing that until a couple of years later. But I knew that this was why I wanted to do something. I just felt if nobody does anything, 10 years down the line, we will have the same people in this same situation, just maybe a lot more frustrated but nothing will change. And that was why I set up Graduate Pro. What Graduate Pro was supposed to do was basically help them understand how the mind of an employer works and the requirements of the African marketplace. So um, in doing that, I kept thinking, because for everything that you're trying to do, you need a platform. Um, and because my background is in theater and communication arts, that's what I studied in school. I understood the power of the media, because I mean, MTV has our kids locked mm -hmm. down. Trace, Urban, you know, Sound I, City. I, I hear the founder of um, MTV was said to have said mm -hmm. that he owns this generation. But that's it. They do. Mm -hmm. mm, they do. We don't know, but the kids know. You know, N understanding the power of media. I knew I was going to plug into three things. One, um, the power of audiovisuals. Two, the pervasiveness of internet and mobile technology. And three, the attraction of young people 
to the creative industries. They don't want to listen to anything you have to say, but if it's music, if it's film, if it's dance, you, you have, have their attention. Yeah. Exactly. So I knew I was going to plug into that, but how I was going to do that, I wasn't sure. As at the time I was writing the book, um, I didn't know I was writing a book. <laughs> I was writing because I needed to pour what I wanted to say somewhere. And then, yeah, yeah, you know, I was just writing. In fact, we tried animation at some point, but, and a friend of mine looked at the content and said, but you, you know you have a book? And I said, book? So it was when he said book, I thought, oh, okay, this can actually be a book. So I finalized the content, but I mean, even if you want to do a book, you have to think about how you want to release. I knew I wasn't going to print. Media is my space, and... I know, if you look at, for example, McKinsey's global media report for 2015, the trends for print is going this way. The trend for digital is going that way. So I don't need a babalao to tell me that printing is not the way to go. You know? And then I thought, I mean, when you're driving, you keep honking, and then the dude is bouncing. He can't hear you because there's some earpiece, and he's listening to something. And I thought, OK. You know, sometimes you might think it's a problem, but the culture is not a problem plug into the culture. The easiest way to get in front of someone is to stand in a way that wh whatever it is you're doing is attractive, which is why we decided to do um, audio. But audio is not enough as a format. We had to think about how to make it interesting. Audio books are not very interesting. you know. And that was why we got the kind of people that we got to read. Basically asking, who are the people that young people look up to? Who do they admire? Who do they want to become? Who do they listen to? And then it was, it was hectic coming up with a list of 55 Nigerians that were going to read. It took us about four months of just, because we didn't want to go on Google and say, oh, the media said this. We made calls. We followed up. Who are people doing things on the ground? They may have two Twitter followers, but <laughs> offline things are happening. And that's how we, we, we came up with the list. And then we started recording. The hashtag, we stumbled on it. It wasn't, um, in trying to look for a template to make our work easier, we realized that nobody had done what we were trying to do. Um, hold that thought. We need to take a quick break. Okay, that's fine. Viewers, we'll be right back after the break. Stay tuned. <laughs> We still have with us Naomi Lucas and we're talking about Africa's biggest book project. So you talked about how you stumbled on the hashtag Africa's biggest book project. Can you tell us about that and what is this book? Okay. Um, like I was saying before we went on the break, um, I was looking for, I mean, I'm a project manager, so I was looking for a template. Like if somebody has done something before, don't reinvent the wheel. Just, okay, what did they do? Pick Modified. the template. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I, I typed all sorts of things into my search bar and I couldn't find anything remotely close to guide how I was going to execute the project. I had it here. In fact, it was difficult to get my sound designer um, and a couple of other people because they didn't understand what I was trying to say. But I kept saying, no, this is what I see. This is what I'm trying to do. So I just thought, okay, let me look for a template. When I checked and I couldn't find anything, I said, oh, wow. So you mean we're going to be the guinea pigs? OK, cool. So we had to, between myself and my team, we thought, OK, so what do we call this book that will make sure that anybody anywhere will stop, even if it's just for a second, to pay attention? So we said, Africa's Biggest Book Project, that's what it is. I mean, you're doing an audio book. It's a new format, but it's still a book. 
I don't know if there's anywhere in Africa where we have 55 people reading from a book. It's 51 chapters, um, and basically broken into four segments. Self-discovery, career planning, um, and then we have lots of um, guidance for people who want to stay ahead because we've realized that there are people who have worked for eight years, five years, but are still as confused as the, as the ones who just finished school. So essentially that's what the book is about. We wrote a devotional style because there are 52, okay. 52 weeks in a year, where it's 51 chapters. The last chapter is blank. And essentially you are supposed to write the last, the last chapter. chapter. After we've told you everything, we're asking you, now what? Um, I tell people that it's not a how-to book. The problem with education in Africa is that we keep telling our young people how to think. We keep telling them how to do stuff. But a lot of them don't know why. So it's a why-to book. I don't tell you, there are like a million and one books out there on how to find the job, how to ace this interview, how to, how to, how to, um, yeah. So you can read those ones. It's a why-to book. We tell you how the mind of an employer works. We tell you what happens when you go for an interview and they tell you, okay, we'll get back to you, and they never do. We tell you how the job market works, but we say it with a lot of empathy, a lot of wit. It's a hilarious book. Okay, we had a recording yesterday, and you know, we, it's, the, the schedule is intense from like 9 a.m. to like 8 p.m. We're just doing back to back to back to back. But you know, I saw the crew leaving leaving for home yesterday and they were giggling and I thought, okay, this is how to work, where you enjoy what you do. So it's very, it's not that serious. Like, okay, what is a CV? A CV is this, because young people don't learn like that. So while we say stuff and then we chip in funny stuff here and there, it's so, it's light, it's light enough for you to absorb without feeling like somebody's preaching at you. That's what the book is about. And we have 55 narrators. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, so, 55, wow, that's a lot. Um, yes. Who are these people? How do you choose them? It took a lot to find these people. It took a lot to, for some of them to get around to saying, yes, I want to do this. Because, I mean, not everyone wants to be in front of a camera. People sometimes like their privacy. It's a fine balance between state of origin, religion, gender, career, sector, age, all of these things we took into consideration because we wanted the broadest representation possible of exemplary Nigerians. Nigeria. So you don't have um, 48 people from the southwest and two from the north. And you think, okay, well, people from the south, south, they, they're, they're not good for anything anyway. So for almost every state, we have somebody from that state who technically is like the beacon that we're, we're, we're presenting to young people, like, this is somebody from your, from state. your state. So that's how we came up with that list. We would have loved to have some people on this project. Some came back to say, sorry, my schedule will not allow me to be a part of it. Some never came back. Some were nasty. Um, yeah, but we have 55 people, and I am very, very happy with that list, trust wow. me. Very so 55 people, um, a lot of people in Nigeria feel that, a lot of young people feel that you have to have connections. Now, you're talking about 55 people that you probably didn't know. How did you bridge that? How did you, you know, break that barrier? Okay. Um, okay, anyone who knows me knows that I can be like a dog with a bone. When I, like I said, when I started, in fact, you said, tell me about yourself, and I just said I'm a passionate person. <laughs> I am actually a passionate person, and once I put my mind to do something, it's like there's no plan B when I start to do something. Mm. So it's taken a lot of relentlessness. Do they, do you go and meet them or how mm -hmm. does it work? We had two um, locations, one in Lagos, somewhere in Ikoi, in the sound designer's place. And then we had one, we, we, went, we traveled to Abuja, the entire crew, almost about 10 of us, and mm. we're there for almost two weeks to record people from that region. And maybe I should just use this opportunity to talk about the narrators from the north, because as at the time that I was going to the north, one, this is a project that my company is funding. It's gulping a lot of money. It's a small company, and we have to find a way to balance that with the requirements of running a business. 
you know. So by the time I was going to Abuja, I just felt like I'd overstretched myself from every angle and I just wanted to lie down and, you know, just... But when, for example, I have um, one of the narrators, she has a PhD, but she's a farmer. And she has become, her farm has become like a safe place for young unemployed people and abused women. Because the things that they farm is not good, is not, um, not good, is not um, enough to sustain everybody who is involved in that process. They found a way to begin to recycle the waste from the farm mm. and sell the things that they make. And I thought that that was just brilliant. She, 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 was in, she took public transport and she was on the road for nine hours. Wow. Yes, to, she, to, come. To, to come to Abuja to record. And wow. she paid, lodged in Abuja. And then the next day, she had to actually break her journey back because she was so tired. You know, somebody drove in from Jaws. Another lady came in from Kaduna. And I just thought, you have to finish this. Like, the commitment from people that I either didn't know or just knew from a distance, it was, it was amazing. Wow. Yes. That, that's amazing. Because mm -hmm. clearly they're passionate about it very as much passionate. as you are. And that's very why they would passionate. sacrifice. Yes. Um, how do you fund this? Um, ECLA is funding this for now. Mm. Maybe I should talk to you about what's, where this is going. Yeah, exactly. The audiobook is a funding strategy for work readiness boot camps okay, that, we want, that? that we want to implement across Africa. Um, some people will stone me when I say it, but I say that we have to have a pan-African approach for solving the unemployment problem. I've done quite a bit of travel around Africa myself, and I know that the cluelessness and the confusion the Ghanaian is as confused as the Nigerian in Sokoto. So in writing the book, I wrote it for the African market. So it's like a template. Yes, I wrote it for the African market. So we want to implement work readiness boot camps across Africa. I say this respectfully that the CV workshops are good. The one day how to find your dream job seminars are fantastic. But you see, the problem with today's young person needs more than a day to fix. They need an entire reorientation. So we, which other countries are you looking at? Doing to? We, we want to cover all of um, the sub-Saharan Africa, between, including Tunisia and Egypt, mm. between now and the year 2020, okay. the end of the year 2020. I made this presentation at a foundation, and the guy just thought, I don't know what to call this, overambition or what? <laughs> but I thought, maybe because I'm a project person, I, it's easy for me to see how that can work. Yeah, I mean, I'm a uh, <laughs> It's easy for me to see, you know, we, we think about projects and we think, okay, Naomi has to be in every country, beginning to end, doing everything. That's why you have people, mm -hmm. you know. So if we have people who can drive the process in different countries and then you already have a blueprint and you can guide, mm -hmm. that's what it takes. So, so. Uh, you know, you were talking, initially you talked about that the problem is a skills problem. Mm -hmm. Why is there, what is the actual, what is causing this problem? And... How can we stop it? How can we change it? The educational system in Africa configures its product to fail from the moment they get out of school. My lecturer taught me with his notebooks the notes that he took when he was a student. Oh. Wow. I don't know you. Mm, mm. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> mm. Mm. And I'm supposed to be useful as a person when I come out of school. But here's where I blame the young person. Irrespective of the kind of education you got, get, are going to get, or are getting, it's your personal responsibility to make sure that you're useful and relevant by the time you're ready to enter the job market. Because you're a product of that same You system. are a product. So, I mean, are you just going to keep saying, hey, but they didn't teach us, they didn't teach us? By the time you're out of school, nobody really cares who taught you or who didn't teach you. They just want to know what you know. So the problem is the system. I don't know if we have the political will to Change. drive the kind of... Is it more investment in the education sector or... Oh, it's a lot of problems. One, the quality of instruction. We need people who are interested in imparting people to take up professions, as opposed to, I need a job, so lecturing is a job, now I'm lecturing. 
So there's the quality of instruction. There's the infrastructure. The infra I mean, World QS ranking has a, a criteria for ranking universities across the world. Um, their 2015 slash 2016 ranking just came out two days ago. No Nigerian university is in the top 700 universities in the world. Wow. Top 700? 700. 700. Mm. Mm. And has this always been the case? I think before, one, I think there was a time UI was one of the top 10. Mm. So you see stuff like that and you just want to lie down and just sleep because you just think, where, where, where are we going to start from? Mm. In South Africa, there's something they, they did. It's called the Monyetla model, and it's something that I want to adapt across Africa to see how it works. They did it for the business process outsourcing industry, where they got government, business people, recruitment agencies, employers of labor um, to design a curriculum for the business process outsourcing industry because South Africa was losing business to India and all of those countries with cheaper uh, manpower, and they wanted to stem the tide. So they took, a, um, they took a couple of um, young people through what it would take from start to finish to set up, you know, in that industry or to establish in that industry. Um, and by the time the training was done, n technically 99% plus of the people who were trained had already found jobs. Why do you think that is? Because the people who are consuming the product were involved in designing the curriculum for the product. So when we have universities that are teaching archaic and irrelevant subjects, and then your GT banks and your um, Transco and co are saying, we can't use what they've learned, and nobody is paying attention, we're going to keep having the same problem. So why not involve the people who, who use the manpower? Somebody like Dangote should be, should be helping design curriculum. He uses the products when they come out. So he needs to be able to find it useful. Mm. But they don't. We have governments on the one hand. We have the academia on the other who want to keep to the theoretical way of doing stuff. Then we have the grass, the young people who suffer from all the issues that I just talked about. Very quick. Um, unfortunately, we've almost come to the end of this. But what I, what I want to ask is, what has been the reception so far and also when and how can people um, get the book? Mm. The reception has been amazing. I mean, normally you would think that a pro for a project like this, um, an established brand will come out and say, yeah, you know, we've been there, we've done that, and now we want to do this. Graduate Pro is new, Ecla is new. I'm pretty much, I don't want to, yeah, I'm not <laughs> known like that but it has been amazing. I've gotten calls from, I mean, I've been saying Africa's biggest book project, but someone told me, I think it's an undersell because people from DC, New York, the UK, Kenya, they've just been calling like, okay, so yeah, you said Africa, when are you coming to Kenya? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's all going to be dependent on, fun. it's been amazing. The media, I mean, all the traction we've gotten, we haven't technically like paid the media. They've come to us to ask what we're doing and they've documented it and they've, you know, so it's really been amazing. So when are you going to launch this? Now, uh, we need to put the distribution infrastructure in place before we launch. Okay. So I'm looking at between now and the end of the year or January at the latest. Okay. Yes. And finally, because um, we talked about the system and mm. you are a product of the system. Yes, I am. However, you've come out of it and you're doing something very noble. Mm. Um, for our viewers, our young people that are watching now that feels hopeless, has come out of that system and can't get a job. Can you just, in a few seconds, just talk to that person? Okay. For that person who has come out and thinks, oh gosh, like I'm not even ready. This is what I'm going to say, and say to you. Stop being a victim. You are not a victim. The buck stops at your feet. The future that you want, you can have it as long as you learn to live intentionally. It doesn't matter what you have or what you do not have. Nobody is to blame for anything that is going to happen from today henceforth but yourself. Thank you very much, Naomi. It's a, been a pleasure and we look forward to the lunch and hopefully we'll have you on the show again. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you.
Viewers, we hope you've enjoyed this and we hope you're looking forward to the launch of Africa's biggest book project called I'm a Graduate, Now What? Until next week, stay blessed.